Good morning, church. You may be seated. While we start the school of the spirit. Hallelujah. Are you ready for God's word today? Okay, we're going to look at something um, very vital. That is going to help your walk with God. We're going to take a look at the most important and the most powerful spiritual discipline in Christianity. It's the most important and it is also the most powerful spiritual discipline that you have. It is called fasting. That's what we're going to be looking at, fasting, how to fast acceptably. Fasting is not optional for a Christian. It is not something you do if you like. Fasting is a compulsory spiritual discipline. When Jesus was talking about fasting, he put it on the same plane with giving and prayer. And he included fasting there. So Derek Prince would always tell you that Jesus did not say, if you fast, if you read Matthew chapter 6, Jesus did not say, if you fast. Jesus said, when you fast, meaning that Jesus took it for granted that you are going to fast. He talked with the understanding that if you know you are a Christian, one of the things you are going to do compulsorily is that you fast. It's just, I can't tell you, I can't come here and say, if you go home, there'll be a problem with that statement. If is a sign of probability. So it's like, if you go home, meaning I'm not sure you're going home. But when I use the word, when you fast, meaning that I am very sure, if I use the word, when you go home, that means I'm very sure that you are going home. But if I use the word if, if is a sign of probability. So Jesus never said if you fast. Jesus said when you fast. As a matter of fact, this season we're in, in the spiritual calendar, you do know that we have the physical calendar. We also have the spiritual calendar. In the spiritual calendar, what this season is called, from the time Jesus resurrected up until now, up until the time he returns again, there's something this spiritual calendar demands of this time and it is the season to fast let's look at mark chapter 2 verse 18 to 20 from the moment jesus is taken away there is an expectation from heaven there's something that heaven is saying i want you to concentrate on the moment you notice that jesus has resurrected you need to concentrate on doing something that's mark chapter 2 verse 18 the Bible says, once when John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. So you see, even from here, you see even in the old, the disciples of John the Baptist and all the Pharisees, as unspiritual as they were, as on everything hypocritical as they were, whatever it is they were, the Bible says one of the things that they made sure that they did was they constantly fasted. If you remember the story where Jesus was talking about um, the man, two men that came into the synagogue, that should be Matthew 23. Two men came into the synagogue and um, one was a publican, the other one was a Pharisee. And then Pharisee was saying, oh, I fast twice a week. So Pharisees, they understand the laws of Moses. They must fast compulsory two times a week. And so the Bible says, once when they were fasting, some people came to Jesus and asked, why don't your disciples fast like John's disciples and the Pharisees do? So if you're not a, a disciple of, of John, you are a Pharisee. You're not in between. So every religious person either was a Pharisee, a Sadducee, that whole range, or they were disciples of John. So a little bit like what happens today when you see like a breakout. So the Pharisees were following the laws of Moses. And then John the Baptist got up and began to baptize. And he began to have disciples who were not following the Pharisees. So that's why the two spiritual uh, groups, the two spiritual silos were either the Pharisees or you have the disciples of John. So these people noticed that there is a new group of disciples in town. But the, the, the problem with this group is that they were not fasting. And the reason they came to meet Jesus is because they understood how seriously John the Baptist's disciples took fasting. They also understood how seriously the Pharisees took fasting. So they're now wondering if you are truly a spiritual person, how come your disciples are not fasting with all these miracles that is going on? 
And then the next verse, John, uh, Jesus now answered them. He said, Jesus replied, do wedding guests fast while celebrating the groom? Of course not. They can't fast while the groom is with them. Verse 20, he said, but someday the groom will be taken away from them and then they will fast. So the moment you notice that the bridegroom has been taken away, that season in the spiritual calendar signifies, it is a cue. This is the time to now engage in fasting. When Jesus was around, the disciples didn't fast. Jesus did. He took out a 40-day fast. We were not told he took out that kind of fast again in the, in the entire scripture. But the Bible tells us that the moment you notice that the bridegroom has been taken away, you need to activate something and that is fasting. Now, fasting is so serious that every single known religion, whether they worship God or they worship idols, every single spiritual entity, they fast. Whether it's Muslims or Buddhists or Hare Krishna or whatever, or people that worship idols, they are fetish priests, they are bony people, whatever it is that you call them. As long as they have anything to do with anything beyond the natural, they fast. And the more they fast, the more the power of whatever entity they are worshiping comes to play. So the quality of the fasting will determine the quality of the power that the individual that is fasting carries. So you see some criminals who go to some of these native doctors and they'll give them the type of fast. Some will say, okay, just don't eat food. Some will say, don't eat food. Also, do not come out under the sun. You know, the deeper the commitment of the fast it would determine the amount of power that that particular individual carries. So fasting is so powerful that every single religion under the face of the earth, from grail message, call it whatever name, they all fast because they've understood the power that is embedded in fasting. And Jesus told us it is a compulsory spiritual discipline. You cannot do without it. Saying you can function as a Christian without fasting is exactly like saying you can function as a Christian without praying. You know that that is impossible. It is also like saying you can function as a Christian without giving. These three spiritual disciplines are the ones that Jesus called very compulsory. And you, if you read uh, your Bible, the, um, the Sermon on the Mount, it didn't stop in verse chapter 5. It continues from chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7. So these are the essentials that Jesus was talking about. And he said fasting is one of those things you must do. But then the reason Jesus began to teach about fasting is because not every fast is acceptable. A lot of people fast and fast and fast and they do not get the results of fasting. They will fast two days, three days, 21 days, 14 days, 15 days, whatever it is, and they don't get the results of the fasting. The reason is because they fasted, they didn't eat food or whatever else they, they engaged in, but they did not fast appropriately. And because they did not fast appropriately, they will not get the result of the fast. So we're going to look at how to fast acceptably. A good place to start to be Isaiah chapter 58. I'll read verse 3, we'll read it all the way to verse 5, and then we'll look at one more example of that. So you see a lot of people say, Pastor, someone recently reached out to me and said, Oh, Pastor, um, I pray. I have a serious problem. I pray, Pastor. And I really, really fast, but nothing is shifting. So I'm wondering what's going on. Why doesn't God want to answer? Well, the answer is because you may have denied yourself food, but you have not fasted according to the way that the Lord wants. The same thing to with prayer. When I hear people say, I prayed, I really, really prayed, and then I'm not getting the result. It just simply means that you are not praying appropriately. Normally I ask, what is the content of your prayer? 99% of the time I see that the content of the prayer is wrong. A lady went to me, I came out from the US recently, a lady came to me and said, oh, her son came back home and said he's coming out of the world. And she was like, what does that mean? Coming out of the cupboard. And she was like, what does that mean? They are Nigerians, but they moved abroad. And he said her son is, um, said he's now gay and that this is his boyfriend. This is his, yes, his boyfriend, whatever. So she, I mean, the whole family banished him and said, with his own you, you cannot come to this place. You cannot speak to us, whatever. You are no more part of this family until you decide to have 
to, you know, to come back to your senses. And then she told me they've been praying and praying and praying and praying, but God is not answering them. I told her, it's possible that the content of your prayer and the way you are fasting is wrong. I said, by the way, what is the content of how are you praying? She said, they are just saying, God, help us. God, help us. Oh, Lord Jesus, help us. I said, that's why he's not answering, because that's not how you're meant to deal with this kind of situation. The Bible already told us, that when you see people that are living in disobedience, there's a power that is behind it. You need to address the power behind what your son is doing and not be telling God, help me, help me. So though they have a problem, though they are praying, they are not getting the results because they are not praying effectively. They are not praying in such a way as to get results. The same thing too with fasting. You can fast and fast and fast. There's nothing wrong with fasting, but you're just not fasting the way God wants you to fast. So we look at Isaiah 58 from verse 3. He says, we have fasted before you, they say. Why aren't you impressed? We have been very hard on ourselves and you don't even notice. Meaning that the kind of fast they're engaging is this kind of fast that wasn't a casual fast. It's not the kind you break by six. You know, they'll go into very deep, intense fast. And from what they are saying, probably this is the type of fast. You don't eat food continuously for a number of days. You don't have any sort of entertainment. You don't go out in the sun. And you really, really restrict yourself from so many things. That's the kind of fast. That's why they are saying we have been very hard. They qualify the hard. They say very hard on ourselves. And you don't even notice. And then thankfully the Lord replied. He said, I will tell you why. He said, it's because you are fasting to please yourselves. He said, even while you fast, you keep oppressing your workers. He said, what good is fasting when you keep on fighting and quarreling? This kind of fast will never get anywhere with me. From this verse, you can see that there is a kind of fasting that does not get result. And there's a kind of fasting that gets result. So he said, this kind will never get anywhere with me. If you look at it in King James, he puts it differently. But the bottom line here is a, this kind, meaning that there is a kind of fast, there is a type of fast that gets result, and there is a type of fast that will never get any result if you are dealing with God. And so if Jesus has told us that fasting is compulsory for Christians, you want to know how to do it right. You want to know how to do it well so that you get the desired results. Let's take a look at another uh, scripture, Zechariah chapter 7, verse 4 to 6. The Lord of heaven's army sent me this message in his reply. Verse 5. Say to all your people, this is talking to the children of Israel, say to all your people and your priests, right? So from the pastors to the people, he said, during these 70 years of exile, when you fasted and mourned in the summer and early autumn, was it really for me you were fasting? So you see, from this scripture, these people fasted for 70 years when they were in exile. This exile they're talking about is when the children of Israel were in Jerusalem, they were living in sin, and God had sent prophet Jeremiah multiple times to warn them that, you know what, judgment is coming, darkness is coming, you're going to go into exile. They did not believe prophet Jeremiah, and then as the Lord had predicted, God empowered the king of Neb uh, the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, he came, carried away the king. Of course, he blinded the king, uh, took out his eyes. They led him in chains, including Daniel and some other of those guys, and they came into Babylon. So that's what God was referring to here. They were in Babylon for 70 years. And he says, say to all your people and your priests, during these 70 years of exile, when you fasted and mourned in the summer and the early autumn, was it really for me we were fasting? So what was happening is they will fast two times a year. They did this for 70 years. So a group of people fasted consensuously for 70 years. God did not accept that fast. That you have fasted for years, done it consensuously, done it repeatedly, is not going to get you an answer. So we want to know how do we fast in such a way that God will accept it. So of course, if you don't have fasting as a spiritual regime, you're already having problems with God. It's like a man that is not praying. So all the consequences of lack of prayer are the same consequences of lack of fasting. As a matter of fact, when you pray and you don't get results and you add fasting, it's very difficult for that thing not to shift. 
So you must, the same way you make up your mind and say, every morning I'm going to pray. You don't leave it to chance and say, okay, mm, should I fast today? Should I not fast tomorrow? Or what, should I pray today? Should I not pray tomorrow? You already have your covenant prayer, which is every day. And then sometimes you can up the game. For instance, some of the things we do at Women of Virtue, we say, okay, you know what? For this week, we're going to do gates of time prayer. We'll pray 6, 9, 12. We're going to do it around the clock for three days. That's not part of the covenant prayer. The covenant prayer is I'm going to pray every single morning. Is that clear? Now, of course, as different activities come up, as the Lord leads, you can add extra things. The same way too, you don't leave fasting to chance. The same way you know that when you come to church on a Sunday or Wednesday or whatever, you give an offering to God. You can't say, I'm not giving an offering to God today. That's the same way you're not going to leave fasting to chance. You are going to have covenant time of fasting. If you are so spiritually weak, you can say once a month, maybe one day every month. But if you're going to amount to anything in this realm of the spirit, you want to increase that number, but you can start small. So you should have a period in a month that you fast you should also have a day every week that you fast because it is compulsory for believers to fast when you are not fasting you begin to see the result in your life you start seeing the weaknesses of a, an unfasted life you start seeing it in your life so let's start by defining what is fasting i'm going to give you three definitions from the scripture the first one, which I think is the most common one, is when a person denies himself of food and other pleasurable things in order to have full concentration on God. That's what fasting is. When you deny yourself from food and pleasures because you want to concentrate on God or you want to you know, have something deeply spiritual, when you do that, it is called fasting. You deny yourself from food and other pleasures. Not just food, you deny from other pleasures. The second definition of fasting, the Bible calls it mourning. It is a time where you take off fancy clothes and you mourn for your sins. It is a time, sometimes the Bible calls it a solemn assembly. Those are, or when you see the Bible use the word solemn assembly, when you see the Bible say mourn with sackcloth and ashes, it is a time where this time you are fasting but you're looking more at the condition of your spiritual life for instance when you notice you need a revival you notice your first love is gone it's morning you do you get to that kind of fasting that is called solemn asleep in morning when you take off all the fancy jewelry take off all the fancy clothes and you lie on your face before god and you're crying out for your sins you remember how far you are falling and all of that it is called fasting in the Old Testament, they will pour ashes on their head, they wear bore wrap, sit on the dust, and all of that. The third definition would be humbling of your soul. You see where the Bible talks about, you know, humbling your soul. If you read your Bible, um, in the book of Psalm, I think it's 69 verse 10, you see where the Bible talks about, humble my soul with fasting. So that's basically what fasting is. In general terms, fasting is when you deny yourself of certain pleasures. Some of the pleasures could be too much laughing around and all of that. Because you want to concentrate on God, like seen in the case of mourning. Let's take a few scriptures. Daniel chapter 9, verse 3. If we read it from the King James Version. It says, I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. What kind of fast is, what, what, what definition did I pull from here? Mourning. This is what he's doing here. So he's not just doing, he's not just because he denied himself of food. Remember I told you there is a type of fast. The Bible calls your mourning. What was Daniel mourning about? He was mourning because of the sins of Israel. What had gotten them to this point where they were now captured. Men that were supposed to be, remember what God said, I will contend with them that contend with you. His ability to come into Israel, not just that he came into Israel, he went to the Holy of Holies. First of all, went to the altar court, went to the holy place where those, um, uh, what do you call that now, the uh, menorah is, the seven candles. Is. The soldier, unbelievers went there. Something that even Christians, that's what I mean, Christian, even Israel, like normal Israel, couldn't even come in because of the glory of God. It was only priests that could come in. But what happened to the extent that unbelievers came in, soldiers came in they took those golden vessels and nothing happened, they entered the holy of holies in fact the holy of holies is a place where only the high priest can enter and once a year a particular time in the year that place was so sacred that 
priest could not enter, only one man would enter. And if that man enters and he has sin, he would die. So how come these soldiers, these infidels, entered that place and nothing happened to them? The same place that is killing high priests. It's the same place some believers enter. So Daniel knew our condition is bad. When you look at yourself and your condition is bad, you ask yourself, when did I get to the point where sickness is not having a field in my life? When did I get to the point where this and this and this is happening to me? That's the point you take out a morning. That's what Daniel did. He began to mourn for the sins of Israel and all of that. Let's take a look at Ezra chapter 10 verse 6. The Bible says, then Ezra left. I'm reading from the NLT version of this. Then Ezra, Ezra left the front of the temple of God and went to the room of Jehonan, son of Elisha. He spent the night there without eating or drinking anything. He was still mourning because of the unfaithfulness of the returned exile. So you see, I'm defining more, uh, fasting for you. He was what? Fasting? What, what mode of fasting? It is mourning. A mode of fasting where you are not asking God for shoe and bag. You're not asking God to meet your needs. You are dealing with your, the condition of your spiritual life. So you mourn. Of course, the art of mourning is lost. So when we do something wrong, we just rattle it. Father, forgive me for my sin. Jesus, you finish. You move on. A lot of times, you don't. Those things have not been dealt with. Two days later, two minutes later, you repeat that sin again because the art of mourning is missing from our Christianity, from our repentance. We just say, Father, in Jesus' name, thank you. I've come as the blood of Jesus. No, you haven't dealt with that. Thing. You're going to repeat that thing again. So let's take a look at the types of fast in the Bible. Remember, we are dealing with acceptable fast. And we started by saying that fasting is a compulsory spiritual discipline. You cannot be a Christian without fasting. Fasting is not what you do if you like. No, it is compulsory. Jesus fully expected his children to fast. And especially this season where we are, the Bible says, the moment the bridegroom has been taken away, that's when we read Mark chapter 2, he said, it is a signal in the spirit for fasting to begin and continue until the return of the Lord Jesus. He said, the moment the groom is taken away from them, Mark 2, 20, he said, at that point, they will begin to fast. And we've seen from Isaiah 58 that there is a fast that is unacceptable. We say, this kind is unacceptable to me. So let's take a look at types of fast. There are four critical types of fast recorded in the Bible. I'm going to show you what they are. Number one is what is called the full fast. This is where you eat no food at all during the duration of the fast. You're not eating any food. I would put here, even though it is under the title I'll call common sense for fasting. But never fast and not drink water. Even Jesus drank water when he fasted. The only person, two groups of people that didn't um, uh, drink water, Moses. Moses, because he was standing right in the presence of God, did it for 80 days. We were, there was no record of water that he drank. And then you have um, the Esther. They told them they also didn't drink water. I think the Nineveh people too didn't drink water. But when you fast, make sure it is compulsory you drink water. If not, you damage your system and that becomes a problem. So the full fast, the people that exemplifies it, you see Esther in Esther chapter 4 verse 16. The Bible tells us when the situation got tough, Esther called a fast. So let me see if you grab a little bit of what we've said so far. So let's just see this Esther 4, 6. You tell, I'm going to ask you a question. Go and gather together all the Jews of Susan and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days or three nights. Remember I told you that they didn't drink water Esther owned. He says, um, my maids and I will do the same and then... Though it is against the law, I will go in to see the king. If I must die, I must die. What mode of fasting did, this, did she engage? What was she mourning for? It's not mourning. No. Mourning specifically has to do with sin. Revival. Of course, the reason you need revival is because sin has brought you to that low level. This one, they were going to ask for material, when I, let me just use the word material, they were going to die, they were going to ask for survival of their life, don't kill us, it's not mourning do you, do you get that? Mm -hmm. okay, so that's the people that exemplified full fast 
So if you're fasting for seven days, that means for the next seven days, from morning till night, you are not eating anything. You are not breaking at any point. So if you start on a Monday, you're going to run through till whatever day you are ending. You're only going to take water. Only. It is a full fast. You don't break at any point. So if I'm doing a seven day fast, what it means from morning of the seven day till I come out of that fast, I am not going to consume any type of food or entertainment. So it is not just about not eating because a lot of people, the reason God doesn't accept your fast is because though you are not eating food, you are going up and down doing the normal activities you do. You're on Instagram, you're talking to your friends, you're doing all kinds of things, you're buying, you're selling, all of those things. And I'm not saying you shouldn't go to work, but when you are fasting, you know, you tone down your conversations. Even the people that you are selling to would know, okay, because if you're still going about the normal way you do it, you've not fasted. You've, there's nothing different you've done. You've just gone into hunger strike. And the Bible says, according to what we read in uh, Isaiah 58 and the one we read in, in um, the book of Zechariah, it said, this kind of fasting is unacceptable. He said, we're really fasting for me. So full fast is when you go around the clock without eating food. You can run anywhere from three days, from one day uh, to about um, 40. The longest full fast was 80 days. Only one person did it. His name was Moses. You are not encouraged to do it and I'm going to tell you why. But uh, let's run through this first. Number two is a partial fast. Partial fast is when you eat food but you exclude pleasurable things. You eat food but you exclude pleasurable things. Daniel exemplified this. Okay, let me give you a few people that exemplified the first one. Full fast. Um, you see Esther. You see Moses in uh, Exodus 24 verse 18. You see that Moses fasted. Jesus, of course, is a great example. Luke chapter 4 verse 1 to 3. You see that uh, Jesus fasted. Ezra chapter 10 verse 6. You see that Ezra called the children of Israel to fast. So they, they did this full fast. They didn't eat throughout at all. They only consumed liquid. The second is a partial fast where you actually consume food, but you exclude meat, you exclude pleasurable food. Uh, like when people are fasting, they always ask me, oh, Rev, um, should I, I'm breastfeeding or I'm on medication. Should I fast? Yes, you should. What you can do is take food that are not ple pleasurable to you. Except you're the kind that every food is pleasurable. Is there any food you don't necessarily like? Indomie. So you avoid indomie. And then you must compulsory avoid meat. Compulsory avoid. Except you're like me. Who are, you're not, I'm not a meat person. I don't eat meat. So I, I mean, I'm not doing anything spectacular if I don't eat meat. Because on a normal day, I will still not eat that meat anyway. So you avoid food that are pleasurable but you are eating food and this is also for people who do heavy work maybe your work demands you to stand a lot or whatever you do heavy work you can do what is called the partial fast it's normally called the daniel fast so people would fast but they are eating daniel fast was so powerful that it brought down the prince of persia but he was eating food. Daniel chapter 9 captures um, the fast. And the Bible tells us from verse 1 what Daniel did not eat. He told us what he ate. He told us what he didn't eat. So there was nothing like wine. So while you're fasting, there's no coke. There's no all of those things. Now, from the scripture, you see that. Okay, let me just go on quickly. So you see you have your full fast. What is the full fast? You are not consuming for the period of time. And you are not breaking by six. So you are continuing till the next day. If it's one day fast, it's tw minimum of 24 hours. If a full fast is done minimum of 24 hours. That means if I start at 6 a.m., the next time I'm going to consume food again is at 6 a.m. again, the next day. Is that clear? That is full fast. If you start at six and break at six, you have not done full fast. I'm going to tell you what that one is and I'll show you from the scripture. So full fast is you start at six, you end at six. 24 hours minimum. Can go from 24 hours, the longest you should stay, 40 days. And I'll tell you why Jesus didn't stay more than 40 days. Moses stayed 80 days and there's a reason. But let's run. So you, you understand what is partial fast. Partial fast, you're eating food but nothing pleasurable. You avoid meat, you avoid fish, you avoid wine and soda and all of those things. Number three is called the isolation fast. The isolation fast. This is when you stay away not just from food but you stay away from people. 
This is the most effective. Jesus did it. The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 4 how the Holy Ghost led him and he went into the wilderness of fast. So most people will call it a retreat. So when they are fasting and they are also retreating at the same time, you call it what? An isolated, an isolated fast or a fast of isolation. That is when you go away from people. You see people, they say they are going to the wilderness, they are going to one place or the other. It is when they are doing this isolation fast. Uh, Luke chapter 4 verse 1 is a good example. Esther somewhat did an isolation fast because she was not going anywhere. She just stayed secluded in one place. Even though she didn't leave the palace, but she stayed there. She told the children of Israel, you go and fast. Me and my, and my maids, we're just going to stay together and we're going to be fasting. So it's somewhat secluded. I don't believe she was getting involved in official duties. But the best is when you live where you are. You go to somewhere isolated the same way Jesus did it. The fourth is called night fasting. Night fasting. That is what most people do when they say they are breaking by six. So there's day fasting, there's night fasting. You know what is day fasting? Six to six. Night fasting is 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. in the morning. Does that make any sense? Full fast and day fast. Do you know the difference? What's the difference? What is the minimum length of a full fast? 24 hours. What is the minimum length of a, of, um, of a day fast? 12 hours. That means you start at 6, you end at 6. Or you start at 6 p.m. and end at 6 a.m. in the morning. Let me tell you how that one, who is good for, who is recommended for. If you know you do business or you go to work or you're a career person, whatever it is you're doing and you need to fast, do the night fast. It is more powerful. Do you know why? Because you're not going to work. You're not talking to anybody. Your activities have toned down. So you can now go home and actually do an, um, an isolated fast. Do you understand what I mean? So that means I go to work, I come back maybe sometime around 6 o'clock, I take out a room in my house or in a hotel or whatever it is and I'm fasting through the night. I'm not eating, but you must make sure you are praying. And I will advise you stop eating some from around three. So you do only your breakfast and then do the night fasting. So uh, Daniel chapter 6 verse 18 is a good example of that. The king did this. Daniel 6 18. I met a man of God who told me this is what he does. You know Reverend Omar Akwai. So he told me, I was having a conversation with him one time. And he told me, I do night fasting. I said, ah, sir. Which one is night fasting? He said, that's what I do for my crusades. He said, I do night fasting. So from around 3, 4, I toned, my activities has toned down because I'm busy during the day. So from 3, I stop eating and then I spend the whole night, whole night in prayer as against the man that is doing day fast and is still going to walk up and down. So that fast is ineffective. So you engage the night fast. The only thing with the night fast is you need a lot of discipline because you're going to sleep because your body is used to sleeping at a particular time. Okay, so let's take a look at the principles of acceptable fast. I'm going to have to... Okay, wait, we said Daniel 6, 18. So let me read it. Then the king returned to his palace. This is the king fasting on behalf of Daniel who was thrown into the lion's den. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night fasting. Did you see night fast there? He refused his usual entertainment and couldn't sleep at all that night. So when Reverend Omar Akbar told me that, I had it in my mind, but I was still doubtful until I went to search the scripture. I don't care who tells me whatever they are doing. I must see it in the scripture. So when I went to the scripture, I said, ah, okay, this is what that man was talking about. So he refused his usual entertainment. Remember, fasting, you deny yourself from entertainment. He couldn't even sleep, meaning he was talking to his gods. He wasn't a Christian, but he had gods he was talking to. Remember at the beginning, I told that every religion fasts. So he engaged in fasting and he did it well. The whole night he was praying, he removed entertainment. Okay, so let's look at the principle. Number one, fasting is ineffective if it has no target. Meaning, you must know why you are fasting. You must have something in your heart, something in your mind, a target. So the Bible says, if you, whosoever shall say to this mountain, that is this mountain, you must have the mountain you want to move. So fast in the air. Even when it is a proclaimed fast in your own heart, during the proclaimed fast, they'll tell you this is why we are fasting. But when you are engaging on a fast on your own, you should have why you are fasting. And you need to write it down because the human mind forgets a lot. If I tell you your prayer point for last month, most of the time you won't remember. So if you have a fast, write um, target, write it down. That's number one principle. If you want it acceptable, then you have to have a target. Number two, fasting is ineffective if you are not spending time in the word and in prayer. 
So people say, right, Pastor, I fasted. They fasted. They de denied themselves food, but they were still, um, they were not praying. They were not studying the word. So it's as good as not fasting. That's hunger strike. Number three, fasting is ineffective if you are carrying on your normal activities. I read the scripture for that, but let me just give you number four. Now I read the scriptures around there. Number five, fasting is ineffective if you have any form of malice, bitterness, anger, all of those things in your heart. It is null and void. You have just done weight loss program, but you have not fasted. Isaiah 58 verse 4. What good is fasting when you keep on fighting and quarreling? This kind of fasting will not get you anywhere. If we go jump to verse 6, it says, No, this kind of fasting is one that I want. And then he began to list the different things you need to do. He said, Free those who are wrongly imprisoned. Lighten the burden of those who work for you. Let the oppressed go free. And remove the chains that bind people. Verse 7. Share your food with the hungry. Give shelter to the homeless. Give clothes who, to them who need them. And do not hide from your relatives who need help. Have you seen the conditions for a fast that God accepts? So what a lot of people do is, they are not eating food, but they are also not meeting this condition. They are mean to people. They are wicked to people. Their relatives have a need that they can afford and they don't do it. Meaning that you cannot effectively fast without giving. Any fasting you're doing without giving is a useless fast. It won't get accepted by God. I'm reading it from the scripture. You see, there must be sacrifice of the body. There must be sacrifice of your finances. It goes in. I don't have too much time to explain that. So let me give you number five. Which number am I now? Five, a life of sin nullifies the impact of a fast. If you are living in, that is, you are living in sin, it nullifies the impact of your fast. Number six, which is the scripture I read, wickedness to friends, families, employees, it nullifies the power of your fast. I've read, read the scripture in uh, Isaiah 58, 6 to 7. Any form of wickedness you're involved in, quarrel, Backbiting, you're living in sin as a lifestyle. That fast is wasted. Number seven, if your motive for fasting is wrong, you will also not get the benefits of the fast. If you read verse three of Isaiah 58, he says, um, we have fasted before you, they say. Why aren't you impressed? We have been very hard on ourselves. You don't even notice. Then the Lord said, I will tell you why. It is because you are fasting to please yourself. Meaning that the motive for which you are fasting is wrong. Example, I want to fast because I want to lose weight. I want to fast because the fasting is going to make me look spiritual in church. I want to fast because they call the fast and if I don't join, it will be somehow. I want to fast because I know that fasting will make my skin glow. All of those things, and you know God can see your heart. So all of those things will nullify the impact of the fast. Let's quickly go to benefits of a fast. Put in another way, what fasting can accomplish? I don't know how many of these I'm going to take, but let's see. I'll give you, let me try to give you up to 12. There are more than that, but let me give you up to 12. Number one, it opens you up to supernatural encounter. It opens you up to supernatural encounter. If you see Daniel, those supernatural encounters he had were because he was fasting. If you see Cornelius as well, the Bible tells talks was in Acts chapter 10, while he was fasting and praying, he had an angelic encounter. An angel approached him and told him what to do about his situation. Number two, he tones down the voice of the flesh. If you are struggling with any kind of sin, so I see a lot of people say, Pastor, I'm struggling with pornography, masturbation, I fasted, I prayed. Can somebody answer me why that fasting didn't work? Do you not know why it didn't work? Because they are breaking all the laws of fasting. They're only obeying one, which is they didn't eat food. That's all. But there are about 12 different laws of fasting. So if you do fasting well, it tones down the voice of the flesh. Meaning that you, you that you are controlled by the flesh. Because remember the Bible tells us Galatians 5, 6, that the flesh and the spirit, they are at war. Right? So what happens when you turn down the voice of the flesh? Your spirit man gains ascendancy. So your spirit begins to win the battle over the flesh. Number three, it brings answers to prayers. 
Number four, it brings deliverance. If you want to see deliverance for yourself, for your family, engage in not just prayer, but fasting. If you want to deal with the powers of darkness, you must engage in fasting. That's why Jesus was telling them in Matthew chapter 17 verse 21. He said, this kind goeth not out, but by what? Prayer and fasting. There are certain demonic entities you need to engage the laws of fasting. Because one of the things fasting does is not because of, okay, when I fast, I'll not be more serious with God. It's because you are living in the flesh and you are fighting devil in his own territory. You can't win that battle. So your flesh has to go down. That is why you are taking the fast. So that your spirit man comes up and is the one that is winning and ruling. Your spirit man is strong to deal with whatever it is. You cannot be half of the spirit and dealing with a full-blown demonic entity. So Jesus said, you need this kind, Matthew 17, 21, go not out but by prayer and fasting. Number six, there are situations that will never shift unless you fast. So, meaning that impossible situations will shift when you fast. Number seven, fasting brings about personal revival. It causes your heart to tend towards righteousness. When you start fasting, you become a man whose heart is primed towards righteousness. If you do the fast right. Isaiah 58 verse 8 is a good place to reference. Number eight, fasting has health benefits because what fasting does is that it improves your blood sugar control it decreases uh, inflammation and all of that so yes that's part of the benefits of fasting it has health benefits god put fasting compulsory that is why in, at night you sleep you are not expected to eat watch animals when they are sick how you will know they recall to a corner and they just stay there because the body is equipped with its own healing properties you need to allow the body to rest while the body is at a state of rest it is repairing itself that's what fasting in those. Number nine, it prolongs your life. Fasting prolongs your life. People who fast well. I was watching an interview of a man. He looked very young. He's almost 90. He said he eats one meal a day. It's not that he's a Christian. He just eats one meal a day because some of those food contain all sorts of toxins and all of that. Number 10, it clears out your gut. A lot of food you eat doesn't get passed out immediately. Some of the food you ate two months ago is still there. It's not an exaggeration, it's true, you can check it. The food is still there. Two months later, it's still there. When you fast, your body will begin to force to clear it out. That's what it does. When you start doing to uh, detoxification. Number 11, it ends judgment. Okay, let me read this one. When there's judgment pronounced against you, you can alter that with fasting. Jonah chapter 3 verse 10. When God saw what they had done, what they had done is they had not eaten food or water for three days. When God saw what they had done and how they had put a stop to their evil ways. What, what do you know about this thing I just said? When they put a stop to their evil ways. What does that mean? They were effective in their fasting. Remember in fasting, I told you, you can't be sinning and expecting it to work. So these guys, they actually did well. They put, um, they put a stop there. If it was, the Bible says, he, he, there is God. He changed his mind and did not carry out the destruction he had threatened. So it ends judgment. Let me give you one more. It opens your ears to hear from God. If you want to hear from God, fast. Acts 13 verse 2 is a good place to reference. Okay, let me deal with... What happens during a fast? Okay, let's read Acts 13, 2 since it's up there. One day, as these men were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, so they were able to hear the Holy Spirit because they were fasting. How are you able to hear the Holy Spirit because you are fasting? What, what's the mechanism? What's behind this? Your flesh is subdued. Your spirit man is strong and then you can hear what the Spirit is saying. Okay, let's look at what happens during a fast. I'm going to break it into two. What happens to you spiritually when you fast? And what happens to you physically when you fast? Spiritually speaking, your flesh goes weak. Your spirit goes strong. Not just your spirit, your spiritual ears, your spiritual eyes are open. That's why you're able to begin to have access to the realm of the spirit. So let's jump to the physical reason. I think that's about the last we'll do. The physical reasons but the physical things that happen to you when you fast. What is the spiritual? What happens to you spiritually when you fast? Your flesh goes down. Your spirit comes up. Your spirit is getting stronger. So the more you fast effectively, the stronger, more strengthened your spirit becomes. And that's why you're able to open up the realm of visions and dreams. So physically, number one, your body stops producing digestive juices. What makes you hungry 
is what is called digestive juices. So every time you eat, you signal your body to produce digestive juices that is going to break down the food. That is why when you eat eba, it is broken down because well, the moment it touches your tongue, digestive juices are produced and it starts breaking down the food so that it can be digested. So when you stop eating, you signal your body food um, intake, food um, intake has reduced. So what happens is your body produces very little digestive juice. The more you stay away from food, the less digestive juice that is generated. That's why by the fourth day, hunger disappears. Because it is, the digestive juice is that, when it's spilled in your tummy, that thing that you're calling hunger, that's when it comes. Hunger returns once every 40 days. Every other hunger you're doing is psychological hunger. May the Lord help you to read biology and Google and study and fast. It's when you fast, you see what I'm saying. Number two, okay, let's look at the second thing that happens to you is that by day two, your body enters what is called ketosis. I'll quickly explain that in one minute. Ketosis, okay, to explain that better, whenever you eat food, your body receives glucose, sugar, all of those things, and that is what your body burns for energy. So if I eat bread or whatever it is I eat, I have energy to function. But the, my body is breaking down. It will absorb the glucose, take the sugar from the food, and store the fat element in the food. Did you understand what I've just said? What I've said is this. When you eat food, there's glucose, there's sugar, all of those things in your body, right? Your body will store the other elements as fat in your body. And it will burn glucose and all that, and sugar. When you fast, by day two, your body enters ketosis or put it another way, enters survival mode. What you do, your body starts burning fat. No more sugar. Because it's trying to, it has burned the sugar you've eaten in that start burning fat. It's called ketosis. By day three, your body enters what is called autophagy. You need to understand what is happening to you when you fast so that you cooperate with your body. What is autophagy? That is when your body starts eating itself. What it means is that your body, the cells in your body, the ones that are damaged, the ones that have problems, your body starts recycling it to use it again. Then your cells begin to function perfectly again. That's what happens to you. This usually enters from somewhere from 48 to, 30, uh, 48 to 72 others. Like two days to three days. By the third day, your body enters this process. So your cells are renewing themselves. They are eating themselves. They are renewing themselves. Is that clear? By day four, hunger completely disappears. You will not feel hungry on the fourth day. But if you are an experienced faster of more than three days, usually hunger disappears from around the third day. If you fast often, disappear at the third day. Do you know why? Your digestive juices will stop producing because your body will say no more food. So there's no need producing digestive juice. So hunger disappears by the fourth morning. As a matter of fact, when you enter day four, unusual energy is as if somebody injected you with energy. You will feel like running a mile. Please don't run a mile. Calm down. Don't get overexcited. That's when the power dimension of the fast starts showing up. Okay, I'll give you um, one more. By, by day two to three, your body begins to detoxify. But from the second day, your body begins to de de detoxify. What does that mean? Your body begins to remove all the toxins. The toxins in your body. All those coke and all those nonsense you've been drinking, taking into your body, even the one you take from food. You know, when they go and do use fertilizer on foods, pesticides, all of those things. You ingest all those things. And then they stay in your body as tongues inside. They are very harmful. So when you fast, your body now begins to clean itself. It starts releasing those toxins in the air. Now, one of the things you will notice, if you open your tongue, you notice a white coating on your tongue. It's toxins coming out. If you're fasting, show your tongue to your neighbor. Let's know that. 
But you see, if you go to the mirror and then you have a bitter taste in your mouth, that bitter taste is a, is a toxin. It's making your mouth bitter. So if you brush once a day, please, when you're fasting, you have to do extra hygiene. You need to brush three times a day because your tongue, it, if you, even when you remove that coating, another layer will come. It is your body expelling toxins. And then you also notice you begin to have body odor. It is the tech toxins being expelled. You start sweating more than usual. You can even be in a room with AC. You notice under your armpits you're sweating. If you touch your, your forehead, you're sweating. There's nothing wrong with you. It's just your body eliminating those toxins because you are not eating food. So they go into a process, which I can't explain now, that eliminates toxins. And then that man is healthier, which is why you live longer when you fast, which is part of the reason Jesus said fasting is compulsory. So whether it is spiritual discipline and reasons, I have about 50 physical benefits of fasting and I have 50 benefits, 50 spiritual benefits of fasting, 50 physical benefits of fasting. And that's why I said, when you fast, drink lots of water. Because when you are drinking water, it's helping the system to detoxify. It's flushing out. So you put that water in your body as you urinate. It's flushing out the toxins, all those rubbish in your body. It goes out. So you can imagine a human being that does not fast. Spiritually, he'll be disadvantaged. Physically, he'll be disadvantaged. Hearing God, he will not hear. Power, he will not have. His life is useless because he does not fast. That's why the Bible says you need to fast. If you want to deal with the powers of darkness, you want to fast. Hallelujah. Amen.